Well, last week I told you that the American Express Centurion card, aka Amex Black card, is the most exclusive charge card on the market. Remember, it takes a $10,000 initiation fee and $5,000 a year, and it's by invitation only. But with that comes some exclusive perks. Uh, we spoke about the uh, airline miles that never expire and the elite status at certain hotels and uh, those types of things. But I didn't tell you about the main benefit. The main benefit of the Amex Black Card is that it comes with a 24-7 deluxe concierge service. What this means is that you get a little number printed on your card, which is, remember, made out of stainless steel, not plastic. And uh, on that number, you call it day or night, and a friendly concierge will pick up ready to do your bidding. Anything that you want. Now, usually the service is used for things like booking a hotel or reservation at a restaurant or asking information about local attractions, but it goes far beyond the merely administrative. Uh, it gives you access to certain things that the hoi polloi don't have access to. Uh, if you want tickets to a, a sold out Garth Brooks concert, no problem, the concierge can organize that for you. Or if you need last minute reservation at a, a restaurant that no one else can get into, they can make that work for you. There's all sorts of little powers that they have, abilities that they have that uh, other cards don't. I mean, if you suddenly feel the urge to go and shop at Tiffany's jewelry store at two in the morning, Amex, Black Card, Deluxe, concierge service can arrange for that to happen as I'm sure you do sometimes need to do that, right? But one user decided to see how far these limits can be pushed. And so he had a list of things he wanted to ask for. He started with one uh, pretty simple. Um, apparently the concierge service even can give you a, a friendly reminder to go to work every morning. It can remind you when your anniversary is. It can send flowers for your wife. And so he was wondering, well, what won't they do? So he calls his concierge and he says this, I'm traveling to Austin and I want a big tub of nacho cheese. Make that a huge tub, enough to fill a punch bowl. The reply was simply, does it need to be in a tub? A can, jar, tub, I don't care. I just want liquid cheese and a lot of it. The next day, the concierge, concierge calls back with an address of a shop in Austin that sells giant cans of nacho cheese. So he decided to persist with his requests, and uh, it's quite humorous to read about this. Eventually, he gets this concierge to do the following things for him. Uh, solve a crossword puzzle. Um, secondly, get help to get daily calls affirming that he's a good person, you know, to help his self-esteem. Um, help booking a trip to space. He actually got a ticket to space, although he ended up not going because it cost a lot. Um, and uh, various things like that until eventually he asked for something that they refused to do. And he wanted to book the services of an assassin. And they said no. In fact, they have a whole list of uh, things that they say, well, that's not what we do here. One of the things that uh, they don't do here is we do not do your school paper for you um, or your job. We do not have access to confidential government reports. We can't plan your wedding, although we can find somebody who will do that for you, and we won't facilitate unethical behavior, for example, hiring contract killers. Apparently, that's quite a common thing that Amex Black Card gets asked to do. Well, you might not have a black card, and you might not have 24-7 access to a concierge service to do your bidding, but you have something that is far better. You have 24-7 access to a father who loves you, who has all the resources in the universe at his disposal, and is predisposed to bless you, to protect you, and to provide for you. As we shall see in our text today, the best part of all of this is that it is absolutely free. So turn your Bibles to John chapter 14. You remember as we've been going through the Gospel of John, passage by passage, we got to the upper room discourse. This is a part of John's Gospel where he slows down and focuses on one conversation that Jesus has with his disciples the night that he will be betrayed. And we saw that um, last week that there was a question that Thomas asked in a request by Philip about having access to God. And Jesus explains that being a follower of Christ comes with three exclusive privileges. Exclusive access to the Father, 
because he said, no one comes to the Father except through me. Exclusive acquaintance with the Father, because Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's what we handled last week, and then this week we're doing exclusive abilities. That this is one of the perks that comes with being in Christ, is that you have exclusive abilities. And there are two of them. But let me read for you John chapter 14, the first 14 verses. John 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am, where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it's enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Just until there this morning, we're going to look at the, the abilities, the exclusive abilities that we have as believers, and there are two of them mentioned here, two exclusive abilities that are a privilege that Christ secures for his followers, and the first one is the extent of our reach, and the second one is the extent of our requests. So our reach and our requests. Uh, in verse 12, we're going to look at the extent of our reach. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me, so all Christians, will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. Now, this verse is notoriously misunderstood and misapplied. And if you believe the wrong interpretation of this verse, it is going to confuse you in your Christian life, and it may leave you disillusioned and disappointed. For example, the popular charismatic author Michael Brown, in his book Authentic Fire, which I believe he wrote in response to John MacArthur's book Strange Fire, he writes this on page 188, Jesus gave a universal promise in John 14, 12, that applies to all believers uh, that implies that all believers can ask God to demonstrate his healing and miracle working power through them. And while we can debate exactly what Jesus intended by the greater works, it is difficult to escape from the conclusion that whoever believes in the Son will also perform miraculous signs, unquote. So what he's saying there is all Christians have this promise, and if you're a Christian, you need to be able to do miraculous signs. Another example from one of the most influential churches in the world today, Bethel Church in Redding, California. The Pastor Bill Johnson writes this in his book, Heaven's in Heaven Invades Earth, page 185. He says, Jesus' prophecy of us doing greater works than he did has stirred the church to look for some abstract meaning to this very simple statement. Jesus' statement is not hard to understand. Greater means greater, and the works he referred to are signs and wonders. Then he goes on to say, it will not be a disservice to him to have a generation obey him and go beyond his own high water mark. He showed us what one person could do who has the spirit without measure. What could millions do? That was his point, and it became his prophecy. 
unquote. What Bill Johnson is saying is the same thing Michael Brown said, that if you're a Christian, you should be able to do miracles and you should be able to do greater works than the ones that Jesus did. This was his prophecy. He showed us what he was capable of doing with the Spirit. If you have the Spirit, you should be able to do that and more. So this is a very widely taught interpretation today. In South Africa, we heard it all the time. Almost every Christian you would meet in the streets would believe that, that all Christians are able to do miracles. Now, the crux of the issue lies in the word greater. The word greater, it's the word mezona in the Greek. Mezona from the word megas, mega, large. It can mean, if you look up this word in the, in the lexicon, it will say this. It can mean greater in force higher quality. It can also mean larger in magnitude, higher in significance, superior in effect, greater in intensity or extent, like the Great Tribulation is a tribulation that is wider in extent and greater in effect than other tribulations. That's how that word is used. So contrary to Bill Johnson's claim that Jesus' statement is not that hard to understand, greater means greater, There is actually some interpretive sweat that needs to be shed before we can know for certain what Jesus meant by this. And it's important because the truth matters. Lives can be devastated by believing something in the Bible that's actually not true because it's not what it says. In fact, souls can be damned believing doctrinal error. This is an important thing. So one possible interpretation we'll start with is that we as Christians and all Christians are able to do miracles of a higher quality than Jesus. That is the common interpretation. Those authors that I read, that's what they're saying. Higher quality, that's one interpretation. Now, there's a problem with this interpretation. Let me see if you can help me spot it. We've been working through the Gospel of John. Can you name some of the miracles, some of the works Jesus has done in his life? What are some things that he did in his life? Okay, maybe we should put up our hands. So, yell one out. What was that? I still can't hear you. Calm the seas. Yeah, he calmed the storm with, with the word. What else? Yeah, he turned water into wine, John chapter 2. Carol, he walked on water. I mean, these are pretty impressive ones. He raised the dead. After four days, he stinketh, Lord. Remember that one? Lazarus was raised after four days of decomposition. This isn't just, you know, clear and bringing someone back in the midst of resuscitation. He raised the dead. He has healed blind people. He has healed deaf people. He has healed people who are paralytic in a moment. They didn't have to go to rehab and learn how to walk again. He healed in John chapter 9 the man born blind and not only gave him sight, but the ability to see and interpret that. We've looked at all of those miracles in depth. They are absolutely astounding. Now, let me ask you another question. Has any person ever done miracles greater than those? Well, no. No, they haven't. It's very hard to make an argument that Christians are, to this day, doing miracles of a greater quality than Jesus has. Now, some Christians did heal. And had that power. Some even raised the dead. So it is accurate to say that some Christians are capable of doing some of the works of Christ. But is that the same as saying all Christians are capable of doing all of the works of Christ? Those are two completely different claims. Remember that whatever this means, it applies to all Christians. Because verse 12, Jesus said, truly I say to you, Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Whoever believes in me. Not just the apostles, because that's one of the arguments. Well, he was talking to the apostles. They would do greater works. Well, they didn't do greater works, firstly. Secondly, he doesn't say to the apostles. He says to whoever believes. So John Piper makes the point that whatever this means, it applies to you as a Christian. Piper, in fact, says this is not just a perplexing verse. This is a devastating verse. I was doing my Piper impersonation there. (laughs) Devastating verse. Because why? If this isn't true of you, you're not a Christian. I mean, imagine that was the requirement on on our membership form. You're applying for membership? 
you know, when were you baptized? Can you do miracles? Which ones were they greater than Jesus? If you check the no box, sorry. I mean, anyway, so that's the first possibility. There's a second possibility. You can tell from my tone that I'm leaning in this one already, right? The second possibility of what this word means, greater, that the greatness referred to here is not the quality of the works, but the extent of the works. And when Jesus says that whoever believes in me will be able to do greater works, he means will be able to do more of the works that I'm doing, a greater extent with greater effect. In other words, not all Christ's work to some believers, but some of Christ's works to all believers. So all believers should be able to do some of what Jesus did. Um, obviously, we can't do everything Jesus did. We can't atone for the sins of the world. That's, that's his primary work. Uh, we can't be sinless and perfect. And, frankly, we can't walk on water. But that's okay. We are not called to do all of Christ's work. We are called to do some of his works, and all of us are called to do those works. And what are those works? Well, if you type into your concordance the phrase, um, the works that I do, okay, because this is what he says. He says here, um, where is it? Uh, verse, truly I say to you, verse 12, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. So that's what we'll all be able to do, the works that I do. If you type that into your concordance, you can type it in English, you can type it in Greek, you can just type it in Google, actually, if you don't have a concordance. It will bring up one other verse in the whole Bible that uses that phrase, the works that I do. It is the verse John 10, 25. We're in John. John 10, verse 25, says this. Jesus answered them, because they say, are you the Christ? Tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do, there's that phrase, the works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. So you can go back to John 14. The works that I do was something Jesus was doing that they should have seen this makes him the Messiah and pointed towards his glory and the glory of the Father, but they were rejecting because they weren't of his sheep. Now, we know that the works that he did was more than just miracles. In fact, 1 Corinthians 12, 29, very important verse in this discussion. You can jot it down in the margin of your Bible. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 29 Paul explicitly says to the Corinthian church that not all Christians can do miracles. He says not all can prophesy, not all can speak in tongues. doesn't mean that none can, it just means that not all can. So you can't make the claim that what Jesus is saying in this one verse is that all Christians can do miracles, greater miracles than me, and then later on Paul says not all Christians do miracles, not all Christians have the gift of healings, not all Christians have the gift of tongues. Because the Bible never contradicts. It's the interpretive principle of the analogy of the faith. The Bible never contradicts itself because it comes from the same source. All scripture is breathed out by God. Therefore, it is infallible and inerrant. No mistakes and no contradictions. So Paul explains that that's not what Jesus meant. Not all Christians can do miracles or healings. So, not all of Christ's work to some believers, but some of Christ's works to all believers. Works like Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before men. Do your works so that they, you know, they will see your works and glorify God. In other words, we are all able to participate in some way of what Jesus did. Namely, spreading the glory of God and the good news of the kingdom. To a larger extent and effect than what he did. In other words, we have a greater reach. That's the privilege of being in Christ. That's our special ability, that we have a greater extent, a greater reach in our ministry than Jesus had in his ministry. And you know how we know that? Because that's what he says in this verse. Look at verse 12 again. Truly I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these he will do because I'm going to the Father. 
So he tells us what he means. You're going to be able to do more than me because I'm going to the Father. If I weren't going to the Father, you would not be able to do more than me because I would keep doing these works and you would never catch up. I have a three-year start. But after my three-year ministry, I'm going to the Father and I'm leaving you here and you're going to go out and do my works. And you're going to teach others to do my works. And they're going to teach others to do my works. And it's going to spread all over the globe. Like the, the mustard seed starts small and it grows everywhere until it reaches all the nations. And you've baptized all the nations. And you've taught them everything that I've taught you to do. And taught them to teach other people until even people in Mobile, Alabama know it. And are doing it. And to put it bluntly, that's better than what Jesus accomplished, isn't it? That's what he's saying. You'll be able to do greater works, not in quality. Just go walk on water and see if that works. Not in quality, in extent. That's not taking away from what Jesus did. I mean, he preached the good news to thousands. But isn't it true that countless more thousands have heard the good news, have repented and been saved since Jesus ended his three-year stint on earth? So on the way here, you probably passed a McDonald's, because on the way to everywhere, you pass a McDonald's, right? It wasn't always the case. Um, Ray Kroc was, he bought a, a, one restaurant, one McDonald's restaurant in 1951, and, no, uh, 1956, he bought this restaurant. There were only eight other restaurants. And he went to the McDonald's brothers and said he wanted to buy, you know, the whole empire. He wanted to buy the rights to it. And so they sold him the rights for $2.7 million. The way they figured it is each of the two brothers wanted $1 million after tax. So the two McDonald's brothers, they come up with McDonald's. They come up with well, everything, and they make their burgers and their fries, and then they sell it for a million dollars, and Ray Kroc takes it, and this happens in 1961. He starts spreading these chains everywhere. And by the time of his death in 1984, there were... 7,500 outlets in 32 countries. And today, there are 38,000 McDonald's in 120 countries, serving 69 million people every day. Now, is it accurate to say that the company did greater works under Ray Kroc than under the two brothers? Absolutely. Of course, there's no question. No one's saying that he makes better burgers. In fact, there's clear evidence that the fries got a lot worse when they passed that law about what kind of oil that they have to use. But no one's saying that the fries are better than the McDonald's original fries, but everyone agrees that McDonald's has done better in extent. No one's taking away from the original brothers. They're the ones that had created it. They're the ones that commissioned Ray Kroc to do this and allowed him to do it. But it was under his work that it spread. In the same way, no one's taking away what Christ did. Christ, obviously, he is the founder of our faith. He is the one that died for us and made all this possible. He's the one that commissioned the apostles to do this. But it is accurate to say that we do greater works than Jesus in our extent because there are millions and millions more Christians all over the globe that believe in Jesus because of the work of the church. And this is exactly what Jesus wanted. Matthew 28, verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Jesus wanted his kingdom to be international, to be global. And it wasn't in his day, but he knew that it would. That's what the promise means. And isn't that an amazing privilege? That you, a little old you, a little old me, in Mobile, Alabama, get to be part of this century-spanning global empire, this kingdom, where our product is the good news that anyone can be saved from their sins, that the price has been paid, that the offer is free for anyone. It is by invitation only, but guess what? You're invited. The initiation fee has been paid by Christ. 
And there's no spending limit. No matter how much sin you have, it's all covered by the blood of Christ. But wait. If you sign up now, you get another privilege for free. That brings us to our second point. So the first one is the extent of our reach. That's a privilege that comes with the abilities of being in Christ. The second one is the extent of our requests. Look at verse 14. Well, we'll start in verse 13. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Isn't that amazing? That's better than a 24-7 concierge service, isn't it? You ask me anything in my name and I will do it. That is a promise. Again, I believe this extends to all believers because he's still talking about whoever believes in me will be able to do these things, not just the apostles. So as believers, we have this exclusive access to this deluxe service 24-7 for assistance. But contrary to popular belief, there are limits. And you say, no, 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 no. I just heard him say anything that you ask. But remember what I taught you. You can't just pluck one little piece of a verse out and camp on that and just build an entire theology. Come back next Sunday evening for the sermon on the cults to learn how to do that. You can't do that. You have to take the verse in its context. If you're standing on this side of the bridge and the, and the water's flowing this way, and you go on that side of the bridge and the water's flowing the same way, then if you're standing on the bridge and you can't see where the water is, you know what, you've got a pretty good idea which direction it's going. The same way. So if you look at the context here, keep reading what it says. Whatever you ask, not whatever you ask, period, but whatever you ask in my name. There's a condition. Maybe you missed it first time around. This I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. There's another condition. And if you ask me anything, let me make sure I put it in there again just in case, in my name, I will do it. So, there are two conditions. Firstly, your requests must line up with the glory of God. You can request anything you want of God, but it mustn't be for your glory or for the glory of a person. It must be for God's glory in the Son. Not any God, but the God through Jesus, as he's just said. He's the exclusive access to the Father. And secondly, it needs to line up with Christ's name. And we've done studies in the past on what that means. It doesn't just mean you sprinkle the phrase, in Jesus' name, on the end. Footnote, in Jesus' name, and then you get whatever you want. Lord, I want a Ferrari. How come I never get a Ferrari? Oh, I forgot. Lord, I want a Ferrari in Jesus' name. Hey, I got one! And it's red like the blood of Christ. You see, it's for the ministry. No, that's just not how praying works. You pray for the glory of the Father. Lord, I really want a Ferrari so that I can take people to church in it. What, one person? One short person you're going to take to church? No. What what are you doing for the glory of God? This isn't just a blank check from the genie in the bottle to get the wife that you want and the job that you want and the house that you want with the pet that you want and the kids that you want. That's just not how this works. Jesus did not die to make you happy and healthy. He died to make you holy. Let me say that one again. (laughs) Because there are some Christians out there that are actually living out an entirely different religion because they don't understand that one fact. Jesus did not come to die to make you healthy and happy in this life. He came to die to pay for your sins to make you holy so that you survive the judgment by his righteousness and live forever and ever in perfect health and happiness in the next life. That's why he came. 1 John 5.14 is a good cross-reference for this. Another time we're told what to pray for. Whatever we ask according to his will, we receive. That's 1 John 5, verse 14. Whatever we ask 
according to his will. So Jesus' name is his reputation. It's his will. It's his agenda. It's his goals. It's his purpose. And all of Christ's agenda, goal, purpose, reputation, works, teachings, were all lined up to give you access to the Father so that the Father might be glorified in the Son. You can't glorify the Father without the Son. He's already said that. I'm the way, the truth, and the, the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father in me is the one doing the works. Why am I doing the works? So that you see the Father in me doing the works. Why do I do what I do? Because when you look at me, I want you to see the Father. Philip, you've seen the Father because you've seen me. Remember that? That, that he, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, took on the, the very word that we saw in chapter 1, took on human flesh, added a second nature to his first nature so that he is fully God, 100% God, and 100% man so that he can sympathize with our weaknesses, that he can be the one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, and he's the only one who can do that. But if you do come through him, you get access to the Father. You get acquaintance with the Father, and you get abilities from the Father that extend your reach that you can do the works of Christ to bring the Father glory throughout more of the world than even Jesus was, and this extent, the extent of your request. You can ask for anything that you need in order to get that done. That's the extent of your request. It's not like having a, an Amex black card. It's like having an, an Amex company card <laughs> where, where there's a limitless spending, but you have to spend it on the company business. If your company gives you a card and you go and buy a car for yourself, they're going to have a problem with that. If your company gives you a card and you buy products for the company and you take clients out for the company and you do whatever it is for the company, that's okay. It's the same with this. You can ask anything according to my will, anything in my name, in my reputation, my goals and my purposes for the purpose of the Father's glory, and I will give it to you. That's the promise you can take to the bank. And that's nothing to sniff at. People say, oh, that's diminishing the promise of Christ. He actually means anything. Well, firstly, try that and just see what he says. Secondly, read your Bible a little bit more closely. Like, start with this verse, James 4. Verse 3, James says, you ask and do not receive. So there are cases where Christians are asking for stuff and not getting it. You ask and do not receive. Why? Because you ask wrongly. So there is a way Christians are asking, praying, and doing it wrong and not getting what they want. What's wrongly? You ask and do not receive, James 4, 3, because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. There it is. That's why he's not answering, because you're not spending it for the glory of God. You're not spending it in line with the reputation of Christ. You're spending it on your own passions. Imagine what your prayer life would look differently if you never prayed for anything that you wanted. Let's rather say it this way. Because if you delight yourself in the Lord, he gives you the desires of your heart. What about this? What would your prayers look like if the only thing you really wanted in life is for the Father to be glorified in the Son? And for Christ's name, his reputation, his fame to spread through your little cubicles at work, through your children and their interaction with people in the neighborhood, through your writings, your tweets, your Facebook posts, through the networking connections you make at work, through your family and the name of Christ, the reputation of Christ, the works that he does, the works of mercy and the works of compassion and the works of forgiveness and the works of teaching and the works of example and the works of love. Not the miracles and the atoning work. Obviously, not everybody can do that. But as you're doing that, Christ's reputation is spreading. And that's your deepest desire, the glory of God through the Son and the reputation of Christ? Now go pray and see what happens. I promise you your prayers will be answered. I promise you. Not that my promise means anything, but because Jesus promised that, right? That's exactly what he's saying here. Let me read you those verses again now that you understand what he's saying. It says, 
Truly, truly, verse 12, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, the works of spreading the kingdom, and greater works than these, a greater extent, you'll be able to reach way more, you've got way more Twitter followers, because, you know, there's Twitter now, than he will do, because I'm going to the Father, I'm going away, that's why you've got this advantage. Verse 13, whatever you ask in my name, according to this agenda of mine and my reputation and my holiness, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. There's the promise. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you ask me anything in my name, I promise you I'll do it. An amazing privilege. Amazing privilege. You know what's interesting to me about that American Express black card? It's still bugging me. Is that they say that they, they will not help you do unethical behavior. Who decides what's unethical at American Express? I mean, would they uh, book you a table and hotel for you and your mistress? Presumably. I mean, would they let you buy more food than you should <laughs> eat? Gluttony. Would they, you know, pay for enough alcohol to get drunk? Would they make you a reservation at a strip club? You might be asking, do they need reservations at a strip club? And the answer is, you don't need to know about that. I don't know. That's the point. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how you would know that. My point is, would you go to American Express with a request like that and they would do it for you? I, I don't know what's ethical, what's not ethical. But for Christians, we know where the line is because the Bible tells us it, it, it must be according to his will. And if you're not living according to his will, then you don't have the right to claim God to help you doing what you, what you shouldn't be doing, right? Here's a, here's a little scary example for um, husbands. You know, the ladies in the Bible study at the moment, the ladies' Bible study, they're doing 1 Peter 3. It's, that's great news for the ladies. For the men, I've been reminded to read 1 Peter 3 too, and I was reminded that there's, it's scary for the men um, because it says this. 1 Peter 3, 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Continual act of present tense. This is going to take you the rest of your life. Live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Wait, what? My prayers can be hindered because of my wife? No, that's not what it says. It says your prayers are hindered because of you not living with your wife in an understanding manner. In other words, you can't go to God with requests for more of anything if you're not even being faithful with the responsibilities he's given you. So you can't pray and ask God to just answer whatever your prayer is when you're not even treating your wife the way the Bible says you must treat your wife. And by implication, that extends to all Christians and all of the responsibilities that we have. If you're asking for a promotion at work of your rival or to be healed of a disease or to get your kid in a certain school or so that it doesn't rain in your outdoor wedding or whatever it is, you should pause and ask yourself this. Is the reason I'm praying this for the glory of the Father and the Son and the spread of the reputation of Christ or not? If not, then you get the same response of the concierge when you ask for an assassin. That's not what we do here. But if you're asking for spiritual maturity, if you're asking for endurance through a difficult trial, if you're asking for provision for your basic needs so that you can continue to serve and to minister and to evangelize, if you're asking for mercy, if you're asking for forgiveness, if you're asking for compassion from God, well, then it's a blank check. Then there's no spending limit. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. What a glorious promise that is. God hears us and we have this exclusive ability because of what Christ has done for us, not because of our own merit. And this is why he says, Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. Now you might have a question. What about unbelievers? Can unbelievers pray? I get asked that sometimes. What about the prayers of unbelievers? Well, it's usually asked like this. Does God hear the prayers of unbelievers? And the answer is, maybe. 
I mean, he can. He may answer those prayers, but he's under no obligation to. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. You can't approach God. I've heard prayers like this. I've heard prayers, people pray this out loud. You know, big guy upstairs, if you exist, I could really use a little help right now. Really? Big guy upstairs, if you exist. I've heard someone say that. If you're out there, prove it to me. Without faith, it's impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists. Step one in your prayer, believe that the God you're praying to exists. Seems pretty basic. Proverbs 15, 8, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is acceptable to him. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. It's like some annoying little kid coming up to you after the service. I know we don't have any in our church, but let's say there was this annoying little kid who came up to the service and, and asked you for money and candy. You're like, go ask your parents, right? I mean, you're like, of course, let's go talk to your parents together. I mean, there's a gracious way of doing it. But basically, your answer is no. What if your kid comes and says, oh, dad, can I have 50 cents for the, the machine at the back that gives lollipops, please? Of course, because that's my kid, <laughs> and you give to your kid. And I will not mention which one of my kids did this, because then I have to owe them $5. That's kind of the deal we have. But one of my kids, at some point in our previous ministry, went around church asking the people for money. And of course, the people are like, well, it's the pastor's kid. He's asking for money. What are you going to do? This is what you do. You say no, and then you come tell me. <laughs> Don't worry, we returned all that money. But we are the upright. Our prayer is acceptable to God. And we're not upright because we live these holy lives. No, we're upright because we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. We're made holy by his sacrifice. So we get access to the Father. We get acquaintance with the Father through Jesus. We get abilities of the extent of our reach and of our requests. And the best news is that this offer is for you and for anyone hearing my voice today. It is open. It is free. The initiation price has been paid there's no spending limit, no matter what your sin is, no matter what you've done, no matter how many times you've done it, you could be the blackest soul on the planet in your estimation, and that only makes you more qualified for Christ's grace, because he came for sinners. If you think you're self-righteous and that you don't need to be saved, we have a problem. But if you think that you're so guilty you don't deserve anything, you're the perfect specimen for salvation. That's the good news. And if you are a Christian, what's your responsibility? Preach. Evangelize. Share this offer. Tell people about it. For there's no other name under heaven by which men must be saved. And if you need an opportunity to do this, or you need wisdom, or you need power, ask for it, and he will answer, and you can take that to the bank, because that's the most exclusive privilege of all. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, it is so inspiring to read the words of our Savior, the promise that he made us, that whoever believes in him will be able to do these great works of spreading the kingdom worldwide. We praise you for the power that we've seen in the church over the centuries past, even in the face of dire persecution. We do pray, Lord, for strength now in these days as the world seems to be coming more and more dark, morally and ethically and spiritually. We do pray, Lord, that you would help us to shine in the darkness and that people would give you glory because of our works. We want to pray for our church that you would help us to be a good witness in the neighborhood. We pray for all of the churches in Mobile, Lord, that the gospel would go out with power and that souls would be saved. We pray for our president who's facing um, major challenges now. and We pray that you would grant him grace that you would give him wisdom, that as he assembles a, a cabinet and advisors, that you would uh, raise up people that can speak truth and wisdom into his life to protect our rights, that we may gather together and worship you freely and get on with the kingdom work of spreading the gospel of our dear Lord Jesus Christ. And so we pray these things in his name. Amen. Amen.